Stairs don't go to level two, they go to a parking lot. You're on the complete wrong side of the building. You're gonna have to double back and go through the door you came in and make a run for it. Elliot. I thought I saw you. This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. We are now on episode review number five, Exploits. This episode was really tense. I mean, the tension in this show has gotten up and up with each episode where it's getting to the point where you really don't know what the show is going to do, what they're going to do next. Um, I was actually pretty amazed on how well they portrayed a number of the exploits, hence the name of the show, uh, on the episode. But most importantly, just the overall tension and the resolve of Elliot to put this plan into motion. And even with everything lining up the way it did for him not to succeed, that they're allowing their protagonist to fail and to fail in a very big, almost devastating manner. So let's get into the episode. So the so the episode opens up with our favorite scumbag drug dealer, Veer, and he is in lockup. And his... Uh, Prison buddies doing a bit of an homage. If you ever seen the movie The Great Escape, uh, you will notice what he's doing uh, in the cell is a bit of an homage t- to that. But he's in the cell and he's pacing back and forth and he was reflecting back to his meeting that he had with his lawyer, which somehow, for some reason, his brother was also present at this meeting, which I found very unusual, but I'm going to let that slide there considering how this show has been very accurate within in a number of its depictions. And the vo- the lawyer pretty much just lays it out to Veer that uh, he's going away for a very long time, that he should never have used Twitter and his social media accounts to basically publicly put all his uh, drug business out there online, and that they're putting murder one on him. There's not even a plea agreement. And... He, Veer is looking at this evidence and looking at everything, and he notices a picture in there. And it is a picture depicting um, his gun, some remote controls, and a bottle. And he recognizes that bottle. He realizes it's uh, the Sumnix that Elliot uses to um, cope with his morphine addiction. And he realized that what his lawyer had told him just previously, that the anonymous tip that was received came from Elliot. Most importantly, Vera is saying that um, he's not going to take any deal and that the uh, cosmos have to align and that there has to be um, payment for this alignment. And uh, we end this scene with Vera having a bit of a self-revelation, like he's, he's figured something out. He's figured out his next move. So we cut away to Elliot and the, the boys team and the, here we have another depiction of Mr. Robot interacting with the team and it appears that he is quote unquote real. But Elliot is off to the side being just Elliot. And we see the first exploit which we will uh, get into but basically what it is is uh, Mr. Robot bumps into a gentleman and he's able to take the device that he has hidden in his pack uh, to read the his name tag. And what they're going to do is basically clone that. And we'll, we'll put that in, we'll talk more about that and what is real in the real section. So Elliot, as they uh, use their first exploit, the key card to get into Steel Mountain, to get through the gate, he has a little bit of a monologue about how humans are the best exploit. That if you have an understanding of humans, which he claims to have an understanding, then you find their vulnerabilities if you study them and then you can exploit them. And he starts breaking down his team, how uh, the bearded guy, uh, Mosby, which is the first time I've heard his name spoken about, uh, he's a glutton. I, I call him the uh, original nerd. And then Romero, the uh, older black gentleman, is a know-it-all and a hypochondriac. And they talk about how they're going to exploit this guy named Bill, who is the uh, head security guy, the greeter, 
I should say, that Elliot has to work in order to get him to not only leave Elliot's presence, but allow him entrance into Steel Mountain so he can do what he needs to do. So Elliot also refers to Mr. Robot's exploit as him being clinically insane. And that's what makes him dangerous. And then he talks about himself, how he doesn't like to be outside, how he's addicted to morphine, how he's talking to his friend. And this is where Bob enters the picture. And this is where Elliot has to basically sell Bob that he is this genius billionaire that's come to Steel Mountain to, on a whim, basically look at their program, look at the mountain, see if this is where he wants to, his company to store this information. And he fails, kind of almost in a, miserably, but it seemed like almost like a deliberate fashion until Bob starts looking up uh, Elliot's fake alias and he talks about how, you know, using Wikipedia and certain internet exploits is very easy to put propagate a bunch of information about somebody rather quickly and easily if no one looks too deeply in which they anticipate and expect Bob to do. I mean, they have Bob's character flaws down to a science. They've, they've gone through all his social media trails, every bit of information that's accessible about Bob, and they have found his vulnerabilities or at least Elliot has, and they are going to exploit it into a very devastating manner. So Elliot lays into Bill because he needs to get to the second level and Bill doesn't have access to that. He knows this. He needs Bill to basically call his supervisor so he can get rid of Bill, get access to level two, and get rid of the supervisor so he can access level two. And what he does to, to Bill is basically, he's, he basically just crushes Bill's soul by stating how he is nothing in the world, that he doesn't matter, that no one's going to reflect upon him or miss him if he dies, that he has no meaning in the universe, and that he's wasting Elliot's time, and that he needs to call somebody that matters because he doesn't. And so Bill is just like crying. I mean, this is like almost a five minute long speech that Elliot gives to just wrecking this man's character. And he calls his supervisor and his supervisor comes. But just a little bit before that, Elliot did have a bit of a flashback to his childhood to give him inspiration to make this speech, to use his exploit. And it shows... um, Elliot being abused by his mother and using some of the same words that he's using against um, Bill. He also got a bit of a pep talk from Mr. Robot, which again brings into the subject of whether or not Mr. Robot is real or not because he's talking into Elliot's ear through a little microphone thing. So this is our third exploit that's being utilized um, by, by the group. Uh, before we get into the fourth exploit, which is when he talks into the supervisor and has to do it on the fly, uh, there was a scene cut before that where Angela reveals that um, she put the CD into All Safe, and that All Safe has now been hacked, and that he she used her boyfriend's credit, uh, all these credit credentials basically to do it. It was on his computer. It was his badge. She used the entrance. Everyone's going to think it's him, and that she's leaving him and going to going to her dad's. And then it cuts back into Elliot and the boys team as they trying to get into Steel Mountain and do what they need to do. So the the wrong person, the wrong supervisor comes towards Elliot and there's no prep for this person. The person they prepped for was named Wendy and she has a a pregnant uh, spouse who's about to give birth. And they were going to uh, relay a message on their phone that, you know, she's in labor and that would allow Wendy to leave and leave Elliot alone. They have nothing on Trudy. So the the prep team outside is scrambling around. Romeo and Original Nerd are looking for any type of information on Trudy. And they're finding none. They can't see anything on about her online. She has like zero social social media access. She's much older. There's not really much information about her. They're, they're scrambling. Elliot is about to get on the elevator with this woman and leave this building. When uh, Original Nerd has an epiphany hacks into her phone, uh, relays a message, and says she has to leave and leaves Elliot alone. Romero is impressed, like, what did he do? And he said, everyone has an exploit, everyone has a need, she has a spouse, 
So he texts her a message stating that I'm at the hospital. It's our worst fears come true. And this devastates this woman. That's why she leaves L.A. alone. She's very shaken about it. She basically tells him, you know, just take the elevator and go. Elliot waits for her to, to leave, and then he begins to proceed with the plan to put the raspberry pie into the climate control. So Elliot, not um, being completely of sound in mind and a little bit ar- arrogant, had gone in the wrong direction. He doesn't know Seal Mountain as well as he should. As a result of it, he has to kind of turn back around and go to a different direction. And as a result of this, as he's coming out of these set of stairwells to go back to a direction towards where he can place the raspberry pie, he runs into Tyler Wellick. And basically, it seems like it's game over. And so they cut away to Angela as she starts her new job at this chicken place. And uh, she's talking to this woman and they're just, you know, communicating and stuff like that. And uh, just showing that Shayla is ready to move on and that she's quite capable of moving from one job to another. And she's she's all for this. Cuts back to a Steel Mountain commercial, which is part of this uh, thing that the show does where they show these commercials, whether it be a mostly evil corp one. So this is Steel Mountain explaining what Steel Mountain Paris is. And then Tyler Wellick is sitting there at the end of this is you know standing there with um elliot you know having a conversation wondering what is it he's doing there in steel mountain and elliot has to come with something on the fly and basically he's saying that they're doing a security check um that is just a routine security check by all state and he's on site to check things and tyler Wellick's impressed he didn't realize that it was something that was done and he said you know he thought you know, because Elliot is an engineer, I didn't think that was what his job was doing, was to do. And Elliot was like, well, ever since the breach, they've just been overlapping a lot of their jobs. And he is here to check and make sure everything is uh, good to go. So Tyler invites him to um, lunch with him to have something to eat. And so they go to the commissary. So Elliot has to somehow convince Tyler Wellick to not eat here at this commissary, but go to the executive lounge because at the executive lounge, there is access to a, a bathroom, a room, which will allow them to, again, place this raspberry Pi in a, the climate control vice. It's a climate control system that has been indicated as a place that they can place this in and, and do what they need to do. So Elliot's getting a little prep talk from Mr. Robot and he has to appeal to Tyler's narcissistic personality. He has to both uplift him and put him down and basically Elliot just looks like Tyler and he goes, you you eat here? And um, it does, it stings Tyler a bit. And so they end up going to the executive lounge. And that's when uh, Elliot ends up losing communication with the the outside world. He has no more additional prep. And he's there uh, sitting down with Tyler eating. And Tyler's having this conversation with Elliot. You know, he's impressed somewhat that Elliot is still um, fighting for all safe, even though he knows his company is sinking. And he starts talking about, you know, people. Tyler does at, at this executive lounge. He talks about how that waiter there is uh, somebody who's, you know, you know, 45 years old, has been waiting here for 10 years, has, you know, makes 45K a year, has a mortgage and kids and things like that. And this is it. This is all that he's capable of doing. This is all he is. This is all he's ever going to be. And he calls this, this life, this man, a cockroach who's whose only status is to basically serve him salad. And Elliot is super uncomfortable. He's like almost basically, if he could, be sweating bullets sitting next to Tyler. And he has to try to figure out how he can get away from Tyler. And so he's like, um, I need to use the facilities. So Elliot rushes into the, the executive washroom, throws up. He's questioning, you know, whether Tyler knows why he's really there and Tyler's messing with them. But he can't think about it anymore. He has to get to work. So he gets into the, the 
closet space there in the executive washroom where I guess it's like the janitor's closet. He starts working on the thermostat, starts pulling out the Raspberry Pi, starts pulling the things. And then he hears somebody coming and it's Tyler Wellick. And Tyler is like, I know you're responsible for the hack. Um, it's no secret that your father was a uh, killed because of leukemia as a result of working with Evil Corp. And he's like, don't worry, I'm not going to tell anyone. I just wanted you to know. And then he goes into this conversation about, you know, I thought you were more, I thought you were like special, but to see that you're just motivated, motivated, motivated by revenge, that it's just so pedestrian, it's so ordinary. And then Tyler Wilkes is like washing up and then he just, he just leaves. He leaves Elliot there. And so Elliot finishes his work and he just gets the hell out of the building. So Elliot gets out of the mountain and back into the car and the boys are away. Tyler Wellick, before he leaves, Elliot lets him know that he's taking a helicopter back to the city. Again, it's just his hubris, his arrogance about him to demonstrate how much better he is about everyone. So this is where the story kind of parts into four places. One is Angela. She finally makes it back to her father's house, has a conversation with them. She's staying there. She's working things out. She doesn't completely tell him the full story. He has no problem with her staying there. He even offered to you know, loan her some money and stuff and she won't take it so she's she's at home and she's in i guess her old room and she notices these, these bills there i guess her father had taken her room and, and made it into a bit of an office and it's all these past due bills for an insurance policy or some kind of insurance that is twenty five thousand dollars overdue and it's recently dated and she she doesn't understand that if her you know, her mother is dead and her father, you know, doesn't work for E Corp. And so it kind of leaves the story there. She doesn't confront her father or anything, but it's Angela. So Angela is obviously formulating some kind of plan in her in her mind. And she's right now she's a bit of a wild card given the fact that she was the one who infected uh, all safe with the virus. And then you have Tyler Wellick. Tyler Wellick meets with his wife and they are going to have a dinner with a guy that's going to be the CTO of E Corp. And they're trying to come up with a game plan and they can't figure out this couple because basically there there's no exploit. They're they have everything. They're I wouldn't say the perfect couple, but there there's no wants or needs for any you know point for them to exploit and they're trying to figure it out. And his wife basically encourages Tyler Tyler to just basically take all that they have. If there is nothing that they need or want, they just have to take what they have. So Tyler, you know, and his wife are there. And the guy, you know, he's talking about his wines. And his wife, you know, opens the conversation up. So that way um, the husband is talking to her about the wines going off somewhere else the the wife is sitting there talking to Tyler and Tyler just makes her very very uncomfortable he makes a very explicit statements to her he even goes into the restroom um, as she's in the restroom and just says you know I just wanted to thank you for inviting us over in your time here and I want to very much appreciate it and she's a little shocked by his demeanor and his aggressive manner and she's sitting there on the toilet, and it's obvious as he's positioned himself there, the way he positioned himself there to be in a board, almost like a sexually aggressive, you know, position. And again, he just like thanks her, and then he leaves. And that was the end of that scene, or that way. We have no way how that concluded or how the dinner went about. And then we get to Darlene. Now, Darlene is on an RRC chat letting them know that Steel Mountain is owned. They, The Raspberry Pi is up. They're in Steel Mountain. They can control everything. They're just waiting on Dark Army. Dark Army is like, we're not doing it, and bans her from the chat. And she's trying to get back in the chat, wondering why they aren't doing it, why they're going with the plan. So she meets with a real-world contact, who's her ex-fiance, and she wants to know 
why the Dark Army is backing out. She's being very loud, very obnoxious, and very um, open about it. And he's like, you need to simmer down. You don't say these names out loud. You don't talk about this out loud. And she, she wants to know why. And he basically says he doesn't know why. All he knows is that after the initial hack, that they were no longer, the Dark Army bar- backed out, that they were no longer part of whatever the plan is. And she is super pissed. She is super pissed. She she so wanted this to happen. I think more so than even Mr. Robot wanted it to happen. She wanted to take down Evil Corp. And I really want to know what's, you know, Darlene's backstory now, whether or not, you know, Evil Corp did anything to her or this is just her general stance overall about just taking down, you know, corporations. So we get back to Elliot and they're driving back and he's talking to Shayla and he's touching base with her, finding out how her, she's doing at her job. And she says that she, uh, you know, she likes it kind of, you know, it's it's not that too difficult. And she looked forward to seeing him later tonight. So they had a nice conversation. And as they're coming back, they go back to the, the hideout, basically the F-Society hideout. And that is when they find out that the Dark Army is not part of the plan. And basically, the plan is a bus. Darlene, on the other hand, wants to execute their plan anyway. I mean, they could take out two out of the three servers, cause a, a, a dent to the organization. Mr. Robot, on the other hand, starts freaking out, saying, no. The whole plan was to wreck him, to destroy him to the ground. Even if they were to take out Steel Mountain and use their the existing server bug and wipe out the servers that way they still had china which means they can still put their copies back up and they can be back in business within a month they've lost some money but it would be no problem and the exploit that they used to get in the thermostat will be fixed and instead of stealing not only that but on top of that instead of dealing with one steel mountain they're still going to be dealing with five steel mountains and there's there's no point but Darlene still wants to execute the plan. And she turns to Elliot and she's like pleading with Elliot that they should do this, that this is the right thing to do. That this is why they're here. And Elliot, you know, calms her down and tells her, no, you, you can't execute the plan. You can't execute the program. It's, it's not going to work. It's, this is not what we're doing here. And she literally just breaks down bawling. Elliot offers her, you know, you can stay at my place for the night. So she can calm down. They go back to his place. He goes over to check on Shayla because he she has a dog and he like makes a joke, which is something he's doing a bit a little more often now that he's no longer on the morphine. And she he jokes that, you know, maybe Flipper, you know, will, you know, pee on her bed, you know, for once in a while. And he sees that the door is open and he goes in and there's Flipper and there's uh, Shayla's phone on the ground. And it's ringing, and he picks up the phone, and it's Veer on the other line. And that's how the episode ends. So before we get into the human exploits that are used so well on the show, we'll talk about the hardware that was used on the show uh, for the What is Real section. First off, the computer program that uh, Romero and Original Nerd, Moby, and Mr. Robot, I guess, while they were in the van... We're using a program called uh, Kali Linux that does exist, and it was the operating system, if you're familiar with it. The layout is what you would normally see for a Kali uh, Linux operating system. The other thing is the Raspberry Pi, which I have a link in the show notes, in which someone already broke down that uh, the Raspberry Pi that was built for the purpose of being put in the thermostat, that... uh, is look and everything that it looks like you can do yourself and recreate for yourself. So if you have an interest or if you have Raspberry Pi or have a desire, I have a link in the show notes on how you can do that yourself. It also uh, includes the Armor version for the Kali, uh, which is the program that was used to uh, for the operating system for the Raspberry Pi. The other thing is that the scanner device that was used to the coffee shop, those things do exist. They're used all the time, primarily for credit cards. Most of them are very more mobile. Um, I'm not sure how big the device was inside of the backpack, 
the, the, the backpack that uh, Mr. Robot used to kind of uh, scan the uh, the uh, Steel Mountain employees card so he could use it to get into the to, through the gate but the, most of them are very mobile uh, you do have to kind of like just like a debit or credit swipe thing you have to kind of be really close to gather the information that's why he bumped into the guy that's why he's making all the way up into the coffee line he was making a fuss as he was going through so that his behavior was obnoxious and that it was no shock or surprise that he bumped into this guy and that was it how he was able to obtain the information they were able to use a, uh, a card cutter basically as a whole setup kit you find a lot of these um, on the dark web or the tour sites where you can create your own um, card kit and take these blank discs and write whatever, whether it be credit cards or data information on there. Uh, you will see a lot of employers have these type of things set up with their home resource and human resource or security centers where if you have to ever have to have a, a swipe card to get in and out of a place, uh, it's a type similar setup. It's just for you know nefarious purposes. Um, it's almost akin to if you were a kid in the 90s, early aughts to someone uh, in their dorm room or apartment making fake IDs. Uh, that type of a setup now people do that with credit cards and debit cards and, and security cards of the sort uh, a lot of times with hotel cards really because they utilize the same system to gain access into a hotel room have a free night or a party or whatever for an hour or so okay what else I think that covers the, the hardware aspect of what was real the whole social engineering aspect that was used throughout the episode is something that hackers and scammers and you know tricksters and fraudsters, fraudsters have been doing for a very long time. Uh, hackers are getting very good and better at it. Uh, again, this started when we talked a little bit about social engineering. Um, previous uh, if you're unfamiliar is with freakers those are the attacking term for those who started on the phone lines you know they would hack phone lines with like the the captain crunch whistle thing that's an actual thing that was in the cereal box and because of the frequency it emitted the same type of frequency that the telephone company lines did and if you were to whistle in a certain order in a certain manner you're able to gain access to the telephone nodes and these type of people, what they did was they would often communicate with all the different uh, telephone companies and centers. Um, mind you, this was decades ago, like the 70s. And at that time, there's all these different telephone hubs where you actually had to talk to an operator a lot of times to connect long distance. Uh, to, you had to connect to all these different, like if you wanted to call, to call, call from Los Angeles to New York, sometimes you had to go and connect through a series of networks and if there was a problem in the line you would end up talking to somebody in Chicago or Tallahassee because your line your phone call is going through their lines to that area to connect to New York and so what they would do is they would just go around and talk to all these different types of telephone operators and telephone companies and learn about these people and just finagle and access so they can gain free communication free long distance phone calls uh, which at the time was very expensive to either do international calls or talk at length with different people, call assisted on ra random numbers, uh, talk within different types of companies, and just go through the different, you know, the web that was the telephone networks and figure things out. And it's these techniques that, you know, would graduate and go into the computer aspect of hacking where people use, you know, figuring out people's passwords and commonly used stuff like birth dates, child birth dates. Uh, you saw this with the whole bill thing of looking at Bill's social media platform, his credit history and his job history to realize what type of personality and person he was and know that by looking at the fact that he had cat pictures, that he was um, constantly being passed over for, you know, advancement, that he is looking to distinguish himself, that he's desperate to do so to bring business, to bring a bit of wealth, maybe a bit of notoriety that he would, you know, gravitate to Elliot, this uh, billionaire that he may have never heard of, just as, just as an opportunity to bring business to Steel Mountain, to be given credit for that. 
but also the, the bit of loneliness that he has, that he was not married, that he lived alone, that he had a very lonely personality, so that Elliot could basically just wreck his world and cause him to basically literally cry. You know, a girl man was, you know, crying. This man was crying over what Elliot said about no one ever valuing him enough to miss him. And that his value, not only as a person, is reflected of the fact that he cannot give what Elliot needed, that he could, did not have access to level two. And that was uh, very devastating, that, that use of that type of exploit. The on-the-fly exploit, um, it was very unique. Uh, their pre-planned one is very interesting, the fact that they were going to just say that, hey, your girls, you know, and labor, and she had the hospital, and that was a way to finagle the previous supervisor. But to do on the uh, flip side, that this woman's husband is in the hospital, and that she needs to kind of go there. Is it, you know, it is an exploitation of family. Uh, this happens quite a bit um, within like insurance fraud and banking fraud and any type of fraud to kind of get people they. They prey upon people's uh, their um, family ex- access, uh, the loneliness of people, particularly like you know elderly people that no one communicates with them that very often. Uh, they prey upon the fact that you know you want to leave something for your children. Uh, for your wife, this is this is this for them. You know, you make, you know, you're gonna get this X amount of dollars on your return to investment if you invest like this. That way, that there's a you know, future for them. So this is a kind of a technique that's often utilized, but in this case, it was used to uh, to distract. Well, it's also used to distract in other fraudster type of deals, but to distract. Um, the other exploit was that of. Tyler realizing um, Elliot's weakness. Um, he goes on and on how he keeps his shell up. He keeps all these different barriers up so nobody knows his weakness. Even though he did list a couple of them, the fact that he's a, a morphine addict and that he doesn't, um, you know, he doesn't like to be touched, as he said before, a couple different times. Or he doesn't like being on the outside. You know, he's not a, the most of out, outwardly uh, individual that some people are capable of maybe perhaps exploiting that. But he never considered the fact that his weakness could be um, the death of his father. I mean, Mr. Robot already used that once already on him to get him back in with the fact that his, not only the death of his father, but it's seeking forgiveness or forgiving his father for not fighting the disease. That Elliot needs to do that. Um that is again is another weakness that someone has found out about him that his, it basically goes down to his father this is Elliot's weakness and whether he realizes it or not this is what he's doing all of this for is for his his father and Tyler Wellick has realized that and he sees that weakness in Elliot and he's going to at some point in time exploit that for him for at least for his benefit I think that's why he's not going to tell on um, Elliot at all. That, that the fact that he knows he is part of the the hack into E Corp and that he framed uh, a Colby as he expressed him in his bath in the bathroom stall. The other one, the other exploit that was a failure was the exploit on the part of Tyler Willick trying to figure out this couple, the, the, the future CTO of his company, to try to figure out how he can finagle to his advantage, um, not only being his right-hand man as he proposed in the dinner speech there, but how to undermine him so that he, Tyler Willick, can be CTO. And it seems that he's he's failed at this, that he and his wife were never quite able to find the exploit necessary to undermine this couple or to get a one ones up on them. And it would be interesting to see out in future episodes how this all plays out. But here we see the failure on that part of that exploit. The other is the fact that 
Dark Army appears to not necessarily an exploit, but the Dark Army was able to, for a while, string along F Society uh, in the belief that they were going to take down China. And I don't know the exploit is whether it be the personal relationship that Darlene has with her, her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend or the fact that they are s- such a bit of a you know, kind of ideologue. So they're not in it for the money. They're in it for the ideas, the ethos of destroying this picture of the company because of the, the rot that it is on the world. And so somehow F societies have been able to take it to their advantage because they are, I'm not saying F society, but Dark Army has been able to take that to their advantage, that exploit, their idealism, because they are already in all safe with the, the hack on all safe. They already have access to China and I'm suspecting they might even have access not only to Steel Mountain and the um, root Maybe they don't have access to the root server because Elliot is the only one that does have access to it. But they're obviously taking a full and complete advantage of F Society and F Society just kind of got screwed here because their plan is is done. It's toast. They cannot enact it because, because they needed Dark Army to take out China and they were unwilling to do so. Now, whoever this White Rose is, and it's been suspected for a while, at least if you go on the forums, that White Rose, who is the individual that um, Darlene's boyfriend has been communicating with on the RC chats, the one that was um, convincing Ollie and eventually Angela was trying to do the blackmailer. That was his task. That he was communicating through the RC chat in Chinese. Uh, the character was named White Rose, the person he was talking to on the other line. And some suspect that White Rose might in fact be Tyler Wellick. And somehow he is a part of the Dark Army or he's using the Dark Army for his own ends. Uh, it remains to be seen that that isn't the case, but it's an interesting theory. So that's it for the episode. I mean, a lot happened here. Obviously, like I've stated before, a scumbag drug dealer is going to come back and bite Elliot in the ass. Uh, the plan uh, did not go well, which makes it makes me think about... Um, what would have happened if they went with the other plan, if they went with the original plan for Mr. Robot Head, which was to the natural gas thing, and then there was an explosion on Steel Mountain, and Dark Army wasn't there still. What that would have done to F Society, because then now they're labeled as terrorists. Well, they would have been labeled as terrorists, but their plan would have failed because they would not have been able to use the exploit in China. So in a roundabout way, maybe Elliot has saved F Society or at least saved this plan for another time. Oh, another side note. Uh, Steel Mountain is based off of a real place, which is called Iron Mountain. And I have a link in the show notes of a YouTube clip which uh, showcases the inside of Iron Mountain which is the um, inspiration for Steel Mountain. So that's it for this episode. Uh, Thank you very much for listening. And until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.